Welcome. Um, welcome to the land of Goomerang, where I am currently in Melbourne. But welcome to all of you, um, acknowledging we all gather on lands that <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Very morning here, morning croaky voice. Um, welcome and acknowledging everybody and, and all the lands that you're on. So particularly want to welcome Joy, um, Jack and Anna, who are our presenters, and they are presenting strategies to promote sense of belonging in community practice and research settings. Um, and they're talking about today um, the decades of research underscore the importance of social support and belonging in improving health. Unfortunately, we know very little about the conditions that lead to supportive relationships, particularly among frequently isolated populations. And so their presentation is combining findings from a longitudinal photo voice project with individuals in a housing first program, um, a multi-site photo voice project with mental health clubhouses and a pilot program to re-engage individuals with HIV in medical care to consider aspects of the environment that enhance or prevent a sense of belonging. Um, additionally, they're going to discuss the potential for participatory research to increase belonging and invite insights from the audience. So I'm very excited to listen to this because I've done a bit of photo voice research um, in an educational sphere. So I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Joy, who's going to kick us off. Well, actually, Jack will be starting. Oh, Jack, okay, I do. Oh, sorry. So then, <laughs> no problem. I'll then let Joy speak after that. Um, okay, so I'll get started so we don't um, take too much more time. I ended uh, up reading it. It seemed time. easier. Thank you. Okay. okay. So can people see my screen? Yes, we've got that, Jack. If you just go to full screen, perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this first presentation... Um, We'll be focusing on the need for support and that sense community among people living with HIV. So that's where I'll be speaking uh, about. Um, it is, I'll say, the le least uplifting of the three presentations. And in fact, it's more defining the need for the sense of community and additional support. So, um, but then we'll roll on to um, Joy, who'll be presenting on uh, mental health clubhouses here in Hawaii, uh, followed by a photo voice study by Anna. So. Um, and then hopefully we should have some time for um, discussion and questions and that sort of thing. So um, just to give you a, a little lay of the land uh, before I get going. Oh, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Jack Burrell. I'm an associate professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. <laughs> After all the talk. Okay. So um, I'll be speaking about a uh, kind of a pilot pro a program, though it's representative of a lot of issues we see um, with um, people living with HIV who fall out of care. Um, and largely kind of, I, I see it as representative of the kind of larger uh, cracks in the social system that we see, um, certainly in the US, I mean, it happens other places also. Um, but because there's available uh, and effective medication and um, that to treat HIV, it's kind of concerning that there's a lot of people that don't continually take their medication, can have access to physicians. Um, and what, so we've been really kind of interested in looking at the, in this case, the 50% of people that drop out of their care. Um, so why is it there are so many people that, have, that are living with HIV who should presumably have access to care, um, but are no longer, are, are unable to maintain their care? And at least in the US, there's really a not a lot known about why so many people fall out of care. Um, so this, we kind of did a pilot pr project to kind of start to unfold this and look at what are the, the causes um, of, of falling out of care and what are um, potential strategies to um, help support people in a way that'll enable them to be able to get consistent access to care and eventually uh, lead to uh, a suppressed viral load. So if you're not familiar with the continuum of care, um, I'll just kind of run through it real quick. So what I was just describing is what they call viral suppression. So if people take um, HIV medication consistently, um, you know, usually it takes at least six months, but if you continually take your medication, you can achieve what they consider a viral suppression. 
which is really critical because if you can reach viral suppression, you basically can no longer transmit the virus. So this has been, you could say a game changer, but certainly something that has um, caught the attention of a lot of medical providers and a lot of large public health institutes, because if you can get people who have been diagnosed with HIV to have a suppressed viral load, it's a, an effective cure. So um, in this case, we call it treatment as prevention. So um, we're getting treatment and that will prevent the spread of the disease. Um, but that's of course easier said than done. So originally people are, are diagnosed with HIV um, and through the system, uh, they're the link to care. So you, you meet with a physician, a care provider, um, and they help uh, prescribe medications, provide treatment. Um, so as you kind of walk through the system, you should eventually reach viral suppression like described in maybe six months, maybe years, depends on the person, but almost universally the medication is, is pretty effective um, at suppressing the virus. So the pilot program was, was called treatment as prevention. Um, we worked with a number of people at the medical school also. Um, so I actually didn't um, coin this phrase um, because I actually think it's, it's more looking at the larger systems of why are people falling into out of care. Um, and eventually the idea is that we can get them treatment so we can prevent the spread of the disease. So just to highlight uh, what this looks like. So if you see this kind of yellow box all the way in the right. So you see that of people that are actually diagnosed with HIV, um, in the US, about 43% of them aren't retained in care. So, um, and of the people that have likely been infected with HIV, uh, more than half, that's the 49% on the left side, um, are, aren't engaged in care. So even if they are diagnosed, they're still falling out of care. So we really don't know why is this happening? How is it happening? What can we do to prevent it? So these are the big questions. So where, are they, where is everyone going? Um, there's a lot of kind of, I'll say hypotheses. Some of these are, I'll say accurate, but misleading. Um, so they happen because of drug use, mental illness, financial instability, a whole host of reasons. Um, we, the reason I say that they're somewhat misleading is these are all kind of posed as individual deficits or factors within someone's kind of capacity to, to make those changes when it really is not just these individual deficits or these individual factors, but really a system that's leading to these sort of circumstances that people in these, these uh, uh, that are unable to maintain their care. And that's because of, in a, especially in the US, economic inequality, educational inequality, lack of representative in local governments and um, local communities, just larger discrimination, marginalization factors, and then just sometimes just a mismatch between cultural and treatment uh, approaches. So the physicians come from a certain uh, background, they have a certain um, worldview, and, and so they may be kind of helping define what the treatment protocol is. But if that treatment protocol does not align itself with the culture of the, of the people that I, you're seeing, then it's very, unlikely that um, that treatment will be uh, maintained by the, in this case, patient or client. So we designed this pilot investigation. We're really just looking at people that had what are considered detectoral viral loads, meaning that they um, are probably not taking their medication at least enough to suppress the, the virus. Um, they've missed multiple medical appointments in the last six months. And most had kind of a combination or, or complex social and medical comorbidities or vulnerabilities along with that. So oftentimes that can relate to mental health uh, concerns, substance use concerns, other kind of physical um, issues, so other comorbidities um, along with that. So I'm just gonna give you a few, just a snapshot of some of the, the data, but I won't get into it too much. So what you'll see here though, is that the mental health and traumatic experiences are very prevalent in this small pilot study. So in this case, we had about 25 people that are uh, engaged in the program. And you see that the vast majority have been experienced by mental health or emotional problems in the last month, had difficulty sleeping, had problems with anxiety, um, had even experienced trauma or violence in the last month. You also see that there's a fair amount of particularly drug use. Um, 
And in fact, actually, alcohol use is probably lower than the, the, um, the general um, population. I mean, also that even though there was a lot of drug use, there actually was a fair amount of feelings that they should cut down their drug use. And also worth mentioning is this is a, a group that is actually is engaged in a, a wide variety of social services. So I'm not gonna go through all of these. I just wanted to demonstrate that this is a population that, you know, despite all these social services that are engaged in, that they report that they need, they're still having a hard time maintaining um, their medication protocol, being able to meet with their physicians um, and um, eventually lead to viral suppression. I also want to point out that the people in this program have uh, particularly are, are very vulnerable, have what is considered very low quality of life. So these numbers here, if you look um, the blue, or I'm sorry, it's blue, my colors are terrible. The red on the left side um, of each of these kind of sets of columns is people in TAS program. So these are the people in the pilot program. And you'll see that their numbers are higher, which is bad, uh, is worse across every domain. And that is compared to a, kind of a comparison group of people that are recently housed. So we'll hear from Anna, who also has a sample of people who are, had a, have a history of homelessness um, and recently been experiencing homelessness, but recently housed. And what you'll see is that people living with HIV in this cohort are actually doing considerably worse than even them. And their comparisons to the average adult living in Hawaii is very stark. So you'll see that, for example, uh, the number of or mentally unhealthy days that the average person experienced uh, that was in this program were 16 unhealthy days in that month compared to 14 uh, from people that were recently housed compared to three <laughs> of people that are the average adult living uh, in Hawaii. So these huge gaps here. Um, so going back to the, the social disparity of health, this kind of suggests that there are huge differences between the people in the program uh, versus uh, people not in the program in this case. So we had some qualitative findings. So we looked at a few emerging themes and you'll see that they could be classified into individual issues, social networks and structural issues. Some of these are cross-cutting. So something like transportation, for example, under individual issues can be an individual kind of issue for a number of reasons why someone have, may or may not have access to it, but also suggests there's largely probably a structural problem uh, that might be leading to any one in person not being able to get to the medical appointment or not. But all these kind of things kind of line up to be kind of problems around personal relationships and instability, mental health concerns, housing issues. All these kind of suggest that they're being marginalized, that they're isolated, and they're, they're kind of disproportionately being affected by poverty. What's missing in all of this really is social networks, membership in a community, and opportunity. So as we kind of go through this, what we see is that individual level interventions, in this case, they're, they were paired with an, an intensive case manager who actually was pretty effective in trying to get people back into treatment. But what it's not effective in is fixing any of the, the community level factors that are, in, that are affecting that individual. So in some ways they are kind of a, a Band-Aid in the sense that they're, if you can get enough direct support, case managers, um, care providers wrapping around an individual, you probably can get them back into the care, but you're not doing anything to fix the system that they're living in. So developing supportive networks for people living with HIV can help uh, be helpful, but marginalization and access uh, continue to be a problem. Um, so there really is a more of a need for more inclusive and supportive environments. Uh, okay. Um, I think we're just going to roll right through to the next presentation and then uh, save all questions for the end. Thanks, Jack. And then if you um, stop sharing, I'll, sh I'll share my screen so I can advance. I think you just take, um, I think you can just oh. take it either way, but. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, can everyone see? Yeah, that's fine, Joy, we've got you. Great. Oops. Okay, so just taking, um, starting from where Jack left off, I'm, I'm, my name is Joy and I'm a research associate at University of Hawaii. And I'm gonna share a little bit about facilitating support and belonging among individuals with severe and persistent mental illness in clubhouse settings, both through the clubhouse and then through a photo voice process. So um, just briefly, about 4.2% of the adult population in the United States has severe and persistent mental illness. That's about one in 25 adults in the United States and about 38,000 people in Hawaii. People with severe mental illness suffer a wide variety of health disparities and also quality of life disparities. In terms of longevity, they tend to pass away 10 to 20 years sooner than the average population. So this graph compares the life expectancy of individuals with mental illness in the United States um, compared to the average and then also compared to um, you can see it's on par with low resource countries such as Sudan and Ethiopia. There's been a lot of work recently to identify the causes of disparities and a massive study that was just undertaken by the World Health Organization. And one of the primary factors that they found exacerbated health disparities is social isolation. Um, alternatively, social support can reduce disparities. Studies have shown that it increases longevity, it improves both self-rated health and objective health, it improves quality of life, reduces stress, reduces pain, and also helps navigate hardship like chronic disease, housing insecurity, lack of employment, or difficulty accessing medical care. Um, this photo is from a clubhouse member and something he shared during a photo voice process that speaks to the importance of social support that he gets from his mother. And I'm gonna talk more about that process, the clubhouse process over time. So um, the clubhouse model is one of the most effective community mental health models at developing social support. It was developed in New York City by people who were in a psychiatric ward together and um, they found while they were in the psychiatric ward that what benefited them most was the camaraderie and the support that they provided each other. So after discharge, they continued to meet initially on the steps of the New York City Public Library and then eventually got a space, Fountain House, which is still in existence today and is the largest clubhouse, I believe, in the world. Um, where they could meet and come together and um, have a destigmatized space to develop community. So the people that go that attend clubhouses are not called patients or clients, they're called members because it's really about um, participation and they're guaranteed four rights, a right to a place to come, a right to meaningful work, a right to meaningful relationships, and a right to a place to return. Past research has shown that clubhouses decrease hospitalizations, decrease the length of stay in hospitals when people are hospitalized, decrease the need for other outpatient services, reduce familial stress, improve employment outcomes, and also improve quality of life. There are about 300 clubhouses around the world and you can look on Clubhouse International to see if there's one in your community if you don't know already and or to start one if you um, know someone who might be interested in that, there are resources to help people start clubhouses around the world. In Hawaii, there are nine clubhouses across four islands. It's kind of unique because here they're supported by the Department of Health. In some places, they're entirely grant funded or they raise their own funds through things like thrift stores or, um, or diners. So uh, the clubhouses here serve about 10,000, or I'm sorry, 1,000 members. And our relationship started with them, or my involvement in this project with them started in 2015, initially with an evaluation. And then we shifted more towards a CPPR model. And the first research project that we did together under that framework was a photo voice project um, that took about two years and involved five clubhouses, four on Oahu and one on Kauai. So for each of these clubhouses, there were three to five uh, focus groups and each clubhouse chose a different prompt or topic that they wanted to focus on. So we started out just going in and having a 
a session with all the members and saying, describing what Clubhouse was and then facilitating a group process for um, members to brainstorm topics that they found um, related to their experience at Clubhouse, worthy of exploring, and also that they wanted to share with the broader public. So the topics that they came up with were support, another Clubhouse did the healing power of work, one chose past, present, and future, one chose happiness, and one chose meaning and purpose. We didn't know initially if we would be able to look at these um, collectively, if we had to analyze them individually, but we found as we went through the data that there were overarching themes. So um, I've looked at those, we've looked at those in two different ways that I'm gonna share briefly here. One using grounded theory method that uh, developed a conceptual model of the healing process or recovery process within Clubhouse, and then one using a framework method to look at how um, the Clubhouse process itself could develop or support, could develop support among the members. So this is just an overview of the model and I'll go through each of the aspects quickly. So quality of participation is um, is the starting point because participation and engagement in Clubhouse is, um, is how relationships are developed and it's how um, the, any beneficial outcomes from Clubhouse start. So here a member describes his role as being a chef. So um, the Clubhouse is organized by units and those units facilitate what they call the work ordered day. So there's kitchen units, clerical units, um, there's, there's several different units that really uphold the functioning of the clubhouse. So David said, being co-chef ma makes me feel good that people will be satisfied. I'm responsible for giving you something appetizing, refreshing, and healthy. It makes me feel like I've accomplished something. And you can see he took, he had someone take a picture of him here standing in front of the kitchen. So I just want to point out how different this is from a treatment model or a medical model where people go in just to receive services, he sees himself as coming in and contributing to the broader community. So it really starts with that um, ability to, to participate and to do so in a meaningful way. That participation leads to the development of reciprocally, reciprocally supportive relationships. This photo shows two people working on the newsletter together um, in Kauai. They develop a newsletter called the Coconut Wireless and talk about what's going on in the clubhouse and um, just report out on whatever they think is important. So the person who took this photo said they're building a relationship, working side by side with patience and encouragement. The basic need of feeling needed is fulfilled by working together. That working together leads to a, an increase in the sense of mattering. So mattering can be defined in terms of importance, um, reliance, and awareness, just other people being aware that you're there greeting you and treating you with kindness. That sense of mattering uh, was described as leading to reduced stigma. So here, Laura, one of the members of Friendship House, um, asked us to take a photo of people working together in the kitchen and said that through that working together, you learned to see the person and not the stigma. You look to see the person as the person. It also resulted in increased self-efficacy. So as people discovered their talents and skills, working side by side, they also um, pursued other opportunities. And there are employment supports through Clubhouse as well. Transitional employment, supported employment, and, and independent employment. Here, one of the members says, it's big, you know, going back to work. I never thought I could accomplish this, but I am. I'm doing a successful job. Taken together, these different um, aspects of the Clubhouse environment can result in improved health and, and quality of life. Here, one of the members says, I noticed, again, she had asked someone to take a photo of her in front of their sign and said, I noticed a difference in my personality. Ever since I became a member, I seem to be more happy and joyful. I feel good about myself and I'm proud to come here. So after um, going through that, going through that initial study and, and analysis phase, um, we, were, we noticed that there were comments within the 
within the process and the transcripts where people were supporting each other. And also in the feedback sessions, um, people made comments like photo voice led to a greater understanding of one another and it gave an opportunity for expressing oneself. So we went back and did a second wave of analysis looking, trying to answer the question, can photo voice the method itself foster the development of social support and if so, how? So uh, we looked at use the framework method, looking at four different types of social support, or, or actually I think these are, are initially considered supportive functions of interpersonal relationships. So the first is appraisal, that's information that's useful for self-evaluation. Then there's information, um, which could be advice, suggestions, um, emotional support, expressions of empathy, love, trust, and caring, or instrumental support, tangible aid and service. So opportunity or examples of appraisal, there were different types. There was group appraisal, which generally happened in praise for the photos and also insights about the individuals that came from their photos. So here, one of the members uh, shared a photo in the in the meaning and purpose photo voice about the orchids that she cared for and how that related to her role in her family. And another member commented, I love the color of the orchids and as far as, and as far as how healthy the leaves are, it makes it a beautiful picture. The way you take care of the pots and all that, the medium to grow and the fence in the back, not too much wind, you know? It shows how much care and love you provide for the orchids and the flowers they produce. So again and again, we saw members um, complimenting each other, pointing out talents and um, just, giving, just giving positive appraisal from the, the photos. People also reflected positively on themselves for their own engagement in the process. So here, one of the members took a photo of, um, of a magazine. And when she shared, we asked, you know, how did, what is this? Why did you take this photo? Um, the purpose of taking the photo was actually just to speak to her engagement in the process. She said, just being a responsible person, coming through with the photo voice, it makes me feel happy that I can share. I knew I wanted to do this and it makes me feel happy that I accomplished it. So it wasn't that she was um, wanted the photo to highlight something else, but she was engaging in the process for the sake of the process itself and reflecting on being proud of herself for showing up and doing that and sharing and committing to it and hopefully contributing to a larger, um, she talked about wanting to contribute to an exhibition or an article. Informational support primarily occurred through advice on how to manage symptoms and promote wellness. So in this photo, one member took this photo to um, share where he went if he was experiencing paranoia and that just naturally evolved into a conversation with other members sharing what they did in those situations. So one person said, I've learned that movement is a friend. There's no way paranoia will alleviate without my initiating something. Another person said, I carry dark glasses and lean my head against the window. Um, and I close my eyes and just let myself wander in, inwards to block out external stim stim stimuli. So we can see here how um, they're sharing um, strategies. Emotional support occurred through encouragement and empathic responses to adversity when someone um, shared something difficult going on in their life or their past, often other members related to them and um, encouraged them. Here, a member took a photo, you can't quite see the ocean, um, but he says it's still there and then encouraged the group by saying, if something is blocking your dream, it's still there. There is also seemed to be development of trust through um, relating to and sharing experiences both negative and positive. So uh, here a member described her past when she was forced to go to um, substance abuse treatment, even though she didn't have a substance abuse problem, they didn't know what to do with her during the day. A lot of people before they come to clubhouses really don't have anything to do during the day and it's a big, it's a big issue and detriment to quality of life. So she didn't feel like she fit in there and she was sharing, but I do fit in here and I think that's a good thing. And another member said, I can relate to that because before coming to Clubhouse, I was having difficulty getting out of my house. She discussed issues with her parents. She was isolating. Um, and she says, but since I've been here, I've been making friends and we've been friends too. So there she 
states and expresses um, her friendship to that other person. There was a lot of connection through humor. I, uh, we looked at how many times laughter was coded in the interviews. It was common um, between like 15 and 25 times per transcript we have coded in there that everyone's laughing. So there's bantering, people teasing each other, again, relating to each other. And here someone's took a photo of this exercise machine and says, um, it's for anyone who wants to improve their health, to look better, to feel better, and to inspire others to do the same, but not me because I get enough exercise at work and laughed about it. And someone else teased him about taking a picture of the treadmill with no one on it. And then instrumental support. This is the, this was the lowest, um, the least frequent because instrumental support is, is tangible. Um, but the one thing that members commented on was, was feeling um, happy to have the opportunity to learn to use digital cameras and to engage in this artistic expression. So um, yeah, that it generates peace and just that they were happy to learn how to use the cameras. And also provided an opportunity for reflection and goal setting. So here a member describes his experience at court and then his, um, his hope for the future and says photo voice gave, gives everyone a chance to focus on where you've been, where you are now, and where you're going. So some limitations. Um, this doesn't necessarily apply to all settings. It's just what we found in the clubhouse, but you know there might be overlap in other areas. It could be more difficult in places that don't have as good of norms or where people don't know each other at all. And also this sample includes only people who participated voluntarily and we're excited about engaging in the process. So that of course um, affects things. But I think we can still conclude that the development of support and belonging in clubhouses is fostered through meaningful participation, working side by side, feeling needed, and identification of talents and roles over time. And that photo voice can be a method to foster or to deepen mutually supportive relationships. And I'll pass it over to Anna. Sorry, it went a little bit over to you. Hey, great. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see that, Joy? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Joy. It's um, it's really great to to hear all of. Uh, your findings because honestly they're very similar to um, some of the, the results from our study and so uh, for those of you or who are joining us Joy and I um, work in the same lab um, but due to COVID we haven't been able to uh, meet up as much and discuss our, our project so that was great. Um, so I'm Anna Pruitt. I um, am also at the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, as a faculty affiliate. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, a participatory evaluation partnership with Housing First uh, clients and staff and talking about the ways in which um, we created a space um, quite similar, actually, to what Joy just spoke about. Um, where people felt like they belonged, they had a purpose. And also importantly, how um, they tried to reintegrate into, into the community and to find a sense of belonging there as well. So um, I title it Showing Up and Standing With, which hopefully will make sense as we go along. Um, just a brief background on and the partnership itself. It stems from a housing first evaluation on the island of Oahu. And many of you are probably uh, familiar with housing first. It's, as, it's a program and a philosophy um, that views housing as a right. Um, and it's a departure from the typical provision of housing services um, in the United States, um, which tended to require that people um, fix themselves first, right? They had to attend treatment. They had to prove themselves worthy for housing. And Housing First uh, turns that on its head and emphasizes that housing is a right 
um, and emphasizes consumer or client choice um, in housing and in treatment and service plans. Um, and I will say, I know the language is very capitalistic, um, but the, our research partners prefer the term client, so I will, I will honor their wishes and use that. Um, and so the program itself really emphasizes um, people who tend to not have much of a voice um, having a say in their own uh, service plans, in where they live, um, and whether or not they even participate in services. So we tried to match our evaluation plan with this program philosophy. Um, so we took a transformative uh, participatory evaluation approach, which aims to create conditions and settings in which individuals who tend to not have um, access to power and resources can empower themselves, right? Um, and also, um, we relied, especially uh, myself in the early um, planning stages, relied on um, intersectional frameworks that have been developed by Black women and other people of color. Um, and using that to try to understand um, our experience, uh, the ways in which our experiences result from intersecting identities and systems of oppression, um, and thinking about how that impacted our partnership and then also how our partnership, you know, was situated within the larger social context here. And importantly, um, we engaged in intersectional praxis, trying to under, use this understanding to critique and change those systems of oppression. So our partners included um, about 30 Housing First clients over the course of about four to five years. Um, and at any one time, there were between 15 to 20 um, clients coming weekly um, to our meetings. Um, and 63% of them were male, average age 53, uh, not your, your typical photo voice participants, if you are familiar with the, the literature. Um, majority white, uh, also large percentage identified as Asian, multiracial, um, a native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. Um, throughout this time period too, there were um, 11 program staff that kind of filtered in and out. Um, at any one time, there was usually uh, four program staff um, participating regularly. And then four community psychology researchers, including myself and another uh, um, researcher. Uh, we were both uh, identify as white, female, and we're from um, the continental U.S. Um, and we were the, the researchers who had the most, uh, I would say, on the ground contact. So this was our Housing First community group. And we started by meeting weekly in 2016 um, as part of a photo voice project, um, looking at individuals' transition from homelessness to housing. And we um, ended up having an exhibit at Honolulu Hale, which is uh, our city hall here. And it was uh, widely publicized and um, it was such a success that the group really wanted to continue um, the community group meetings. And so we did through um, 2017 and up until recently. Um, we engaged, continue to engage in um, research. Um, they, the group helped interpret uh, evaluation findings and results um, from surveys. Uh, we co-authored an article together. We applied for and received a, a SCRAW mini grant for a follow-up photo voice study, which we did in 2018. Um, our article was also published then as well. And in 2019, uh, we founded a, an arts hui um, in which we engaged in uh, art uh, for social activist purposes. Uh, so I'll show you a little bit of that later. Um, and we've also continued to do multiple community exhibits across the island to try to uh, educate the public about homelessness and the experiences of 
individuals who have experienced it. Um, and unfortunately with COVID, we had to stop our weekly um, group meetings, but we stayed in touch via uh, the snail mail um, and uh, telephone. So we're hoping to be able to reconvene soon, hopefully. So um, we've done a lot of different research projects, but the ones that I think that are most relevant to this discussion today are um, our photo voice projects, particularly the second one. Um, so the first looked at this um, immediate transition from homelessness to housing. Um, this was done in 2016 when folks had been in housing a few months. And then in 2018, um, I think the average time um, in housing was around three years. Um, and we examined the long-term recovery from the trauma of homelessness. Um, clients continue to, to talk about homelessness as though it was a trauma that they needed to recover from. So for about 11 weeks in the fall of 2018, together we took over 200 photos and conducted a participatory analysis, um, coding uh, photos for um, different themes as identified by clients. Um, so this is a picture of one of our theme boards where we, um, we used to code uh, photos. And then uh, the university researchers, we also conducted a secondary content analysis of transcripts in an, a, an effort to kind of compare the two, um, to the two analyses methods. Um, and then we brought these results back to the group to get their input and interpretation. So the group of researchers were, very, were similar to the overall partnership. There were about 15 core clients who uh, participated regularly in the, the partnership and who contributed to both studies. So I wanted to share just some of the, some of the, the findings because I know I want to give us time to, to, um, to ask questions and discuss. The most prominent one uh, identified by clients and 30% uh, of the photos were coded as this theme were projects, goals, and hobbies. And this really kind of, I think, plays into Joy's uh, findings as well, um, that clients really found a sense of purpose in engaging in hobbies and most of their hobbies and projects were explicitly designed to give back to other people, to the community. Uh, one client uh, was replanting the lawn outside of his apartment complex and had engaged in extensive research into the pH balance of soil. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not gonna attempt to explain it because it, it got above my head, but he, um, you know, he was engaged in projects like that. There was another client who uh, was trying to redesign crosswalks so that they would be more, um, they would be safer. So um, this figured very prominently, as did the theme, my community. Um, and this was about 22% of photos um, and included uh, both physical and social aspects of community. And I want to mention that these two themes are very different from what we saw in the first um, in the first project where clients were mostly uh, showing pictures of inside their homes. There were rarely people present. And in this case, we see a lot of exploration in the community doing projects with other people to try to help the community. So there is significant overlap as well between these two um, themes. Stigma also was pretty prevalent in both the first photo voice study and the second. Um, and what I wanted to, to point out is that only 4% of the photos uh, were coded as stigma. And I think part of the reason is because it's difficult to photograph stigma in some ways. It's very abstract. Um, but it also, I think, really suggest that our kind of positivist inclination to rely on frequencies may not always be appropriate, particularly when working with lived experiences, um, because clients insisted that this was the, one of the most significant themes. Um, and this stigma included uh, interpersonal as well as uh, more 
uh, social stigma, seeing how uh, the media and other people in the community treated people who are still experiencing homelessness was very upsetting. And clients wanted to use this project to address that. And then uh, social support as well, of course, is um, figured in. Um, and it, it figured as being very important to promoting recovery from trauma and included sub themes like helping other people, reconnecting to family, and the importance of the community group and the Photo Voice project itself uh, figured pretty prominently. And almost this theme interacted when we ran the matrices um, with almost every other theme. So it was really pretty pervasive. And lastly, systems change. Um, there was a lot of talk about using their projects and their hobbies to uh, kind of combat social stigma. Um, in fact, 55% of all references to system change were also coded as stigma. And so they also engaged it after this project, engaged in a, sign, a positive signs project to replace all the negative signs <laughs> um, that say, you can't sit here, you can't lie down here, or you know, um, only customers welcome. So they created positive signs to counteract those messages. So what I think um, some of the implications that I think this has for a larger discussion is that uh, similar to other, you know, studies, these show that the perceptions of stigma really impeded their sense of belonging to the larger community. You know, they still felt socially excluded in some ways, but the community group and the project itself helped them to kind of get past that. And they took active steps to address this issue and gained a sense of purpose from these actions. So I think it raises the question and suggests that recovery from homelessness might involve the need to enact social change and suggest that the Photo Voice project itself um, and engaging in this, this change can le maybe lead to a sense of belonging to the greater community. So I think that would be worthy, worth uh, examining in the future. So I know we're running at a time. So I actually, I won't go through all of the challenges <laughs> to creating uh, an inclusive space because uh, we could talk about that if, if you guys have questions. But I would recommend that um, one way to really encourage uh, belongingness in our case was to show up. Um, the group was continuously surprised that we kept coming for four years and they kept coming too and be willing to share with them in their trauma um, and build authentic relationships, laughing, like Joy mentioned, laughing together, eating together, being vulnerable with each other. We are, are legitimately friends um, as well as uh, colleagues in, in this research project. And finally, I think uh, maintaining an intersectional praxis is important, remaining uh, consistently reflexive and uh, thinking through the different uh, power dynamics within your partnership, it was really helpful for us as a group to engage in this regularly. So I guess I'll stop now and leave with some questions that maybe we could address in the discussion or if you folks have other, um, other questions, we can, um, we can address those as well. I know we only have a couple minutes, but thank you. All right, Joy, do you wanna open it up for questions, discussion? And I can watch the chat for you if anybody wants to put questions into the chat and alert you. Um, yeah, I think you already did. If anyone has anything to share, feel free to unmute yourselves and speak up or you can um, yeah, write something in the chat if you want. I, I wouldn't mind hearing the challenges. All right, yeah, well, some of the, um, the challenges that we experienced in pulling up my slide again. Um, one of the things that we realized was that participation, um, so, you know, if we think back to Joy's framework, actually the quality of participation is the kind of starting point um, we recognize that 
even though clients were participating in the um, in the research project that they were still kind of struggling. So for instance, the first like three weeks, they didn't bring in any photos. And this was even though they had asked, they had planned the study. We just mostly facilitated it. And so we were confused as to what was going on and come to find out they uh, were really struggling with taking on this researcher role. Uh, they felt like they, um, you know, they maybe weren't qualified um, or were worried about doing it right. And so participation and quality of participation is, is, a, is a whole construct within itself um, that we didn't, I don't think we thought through uh, prior to the project. Um, and another big challenge for me, um, or maybe it was more of a lessons learned for me, is that um, I think I overemphasized difference a little bit too much um, in, in the partnership. I would say things like, you're the experts, you know, we need to hear from you. You are the experts on homelessness. And um, they pushed back on me with that and said, you know, and really emphasized our similarities over our differences. And I thought I was trying to kind of identify certain uh, power differentials, but they they kind of pushed back on that. So um, those are some of the, I guess, some of the challenges and, and lessons learned, I guess. Um, but I'm sure Joy might have some as well. Yeah, I think that... Um... I didn't. I didn't really touch on challenges, but in the in the my writing about that project, same thing like that expectation to do it right. Like, what does it mean to do it right? That was something that came up a lot, um, and and I think it's you know a lot of people at the clubhouse have done research projects before that is like you're the one coming in to do this, and then we expect people to like quickly adapt to this change and be like, no, actually we're doing it together and it matters what you want to do. And so there's like this, it just, just like it takes time to shift into a more participatory mindset for the researcher. It takes time for the participants to, um, and to establish those new norms. Um, well, great, great points. I'm glad you said that, you know, because I, I get nervous, you know, saying take the pictures, not that fear of whether I'm going to get them back or not, you know, or that they're going to do it and getting them engaged. And um, I think you handled it really well. It was great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I, I tend to think, I mean, we weren't sure if it was because they didn't want to, to do the project anymore, but that, you know, that wasn't it. So yeah, definitely um, consider, you know, all of these different challenges that they might be going through. I always think about what, oh, what challenges there are to doing participatory research for the researcher, but I don't really think about for our co-researchers that we're bringing on. Um, so try to, I, I'll try to think about that in the future. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to be mindful of the time. I know there's another session after this and it's almost, it's, it's uh, almost time, but so I don't know. I just want to, if people need to hop off, I understand, but if anyone wants to stay, I'd be really curious to hear if there are programs that you've worked with that you think have been effective at promoting belonging or support um, or also in your research, things that you found to make a difference. Can I just jump in, Joy, for a minute and yeah. just say, yes, it is the official end time, and but I think okay. that's fine, we can we can stay because it's a break of about 20 minutes. Um, okay. It includes an opportunity for speed networking, I found the term. Uh, you, can, you can be shooted around different groups to meet people and say hello. Uh, and the next session is the panel i think uh yeah the, the the next big session the panel three um starts am i in the right spot yes uh 10 15 i think yeah mm. 10, 10 15 10 15 the the final panel starts uh so we have uh, a little over 15 minutes so if you want to keep talking that's fine we can keep the room open
Um, it looks like there's just only two people still. Did either of you want to share something, Lori or I don't know your first name, Jay Samuel? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I know I have to go, but I really loved your presentation. It was wonderful. I'm a, I'm such a fan of photo voice and how it's used and how it's utilized. And I just really loved how you all really used and really looked at people and how you know, you know, how they feel about belonging, you know, and it, it was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm in Chicago and we're getting word that we're about to quarantine again for 30 days. So I'm trying to update myself. Stay safe, everyone. And thank you so much. Okay. Thank you too. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. I'd, I'd echo that too because I've used photo voice with teenagers in Melbourne in Australia um, but also in remote um, eastern Himalayan India from an environmental oh, wow. psychology perspective um, and you know I've just even though we're doing totally different kind of themed research uh, really interesting to see the, the similar sort of resonances and and the way that you've approached it I really liked your framework Joy that you were using and yeah thank you so Laurie are you there do you have any conversation that you want to have with the presenters she's on mute she might have gone to to uh, make a coffee yeah <laughs> it's kind of that time thank you Helen all right, so we'll finish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Stay as stay safe.